Hi, I'm Sue McKenzie. I've been in the education field for a number of years. I started as a middle school and high school teacher and have worked in training educators across the state. Learned a lot and it's still my favorite sector of the world to work in. And I'm Monica Whiteman. Uh, I've been a social worker for about 30 years and have always chosen to work with some of the toughest families and kids um, in multiple systems. And I feel like we're tackling a really important conversation today by talking about compassion fatigue. And we chose this format because we really feel like it, it's through real conversations and really being honest that we would have the most impact in really understanding what this is all about. When you mentioned compassion fatigue being the elephant in the living room, at first it wasn't, it didn't make sense to me, but the more I thought about it I realized that the elephants in our living room are those things that we're afraid of, and I think we're afraid of them because we don't understand them. I actually found this cartoon that we're sharing here. At the bottom it says, I'm right there in the room and no one even acknowledges me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I find that when we're in schools, it's a whole lot easier to talk about the students or our principals or the things that are really hard about education. And what, I'm, what I really think is important to be able, is to be able to reflect on how we are in the work. And so we want to tackle compassion fatigue in this really kind of open and honest and vulnerable way so that we can um, teach about it but also be real about it so that um, people understand what it is, they can avoid it if they see it coming, recognize it in themselves, and then restore some balance so that they're feeling better in their work and about who they are. So this picture is pretty close to the image that I had for myself in education when I got into it. I, I had a lot of energy and enthusiasm. I love kids, I especially loved adolescents, and I wanted to create an engaging environment and I was pretty sure the kids would get along with me okay and I even knew about problems and troubled lives and the kinds of things that might come into the classroom. Mm -hmm. I felt really ready to deal with it. I, I wanted to be there and I, I wanted to be that connector and educator in the classroom. So what I wasn't prepared for was really how hard it would be. Um, you know, these images that I found actually bring tears to my eyes because I'm thinking about some of the kids I've worked with that I honestly still think about. I, I told you last night about a boy named Chad. I was 24 when I met Chad and I still wonder where is he, how is he doing? And it, it Makes, makes me realize that we so often have stories that aren't finished as educators. And what does that do to us? Um, I certainly have some, and I, and I know that you have some. Mm -hmm. I, I love, there's a quote by Rachel Naomi Remen that I want to share. It, I think it says, maybe where I was in the beginning of my career, it's the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. Mm -hmm. I kind of started there, <laughs> you know, and then I got wet. Right. <laughs> and it didn't always go so well, but hopefully I've learned a lot along the way of how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So compassion fatigue, how do we define it? So certainly in my experience I've gotten wet right along with you, and I've realized that compassion fatigue is really about if you have an open heart and you're a witness to a lot of difficult struggles and a lot of pain in people's life that you will be impacted by that. That you will have, you know, you will feel the heaviness of it at times and it might affect your ability to be compassionate. It might affect your own well-being. It might affect your effectiveness. One option is to just kind of back off emotionally, to, to kind of go numb, mm -hmm. to, to start blaming. And there's actually stages that we found in research that people go through that m might help us to delve a little deeper into what this actually is that we're talking about. So one of the first uh, phases that we, f we see in the cycle of compassion fatigue is something called zealot. And what it is is that willingness to just sign up for everything, volunteer, put yourself out there, say, I'm the one, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, I'm going to put everything I have into this. And we, and we love people that are like that, mm -hmm. don't we? That enthusiasm and the can-do and, the, and they bring their heart, mm -hmm. totally. And rewarded for that. Yeah. We are rewarded for that stance, right? Absolutely. In just this summer, I've had a very recent experience of compassion fatigue, and it began just like that. I had an opportunity to pilot a really neat program with four different groups of kids in the state. And I knew the program was going to have a pretty cool impact, but really wanted to see what kids thought about it. And 
I scheduled all four pilots in the same month. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the first sign. Wait a right. minute. You know, I can do it. I right. can do it. It's so important. It's not a problem. I and I did all these. I, my heart was totally there, mm -hmm. totally engaged. But honestly, by the fourth pilot, I was kind of hoping the kids wouldn't share the kinds of stories I had mm -hmm. heard before because I was already starting to feel overwhelmed by the pain that I heard in these four pilots. So, first sign something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. This next stage, this this grumpy cat. Mm -hmm. By August, mm -hmm. that was me. Uh, it was interesting how quickly I went from this, I want another chance to do great things in the world to the world's a bad place for kids. You know, systems let these kids down, families let these kids down. Um, people didn't understand. I wanted to like raise the flag. Wait, 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 there's kids in pain. As if I was the only one who knew that. In schools with educators, you know, when they get to this phase of irritability, there's this pulling back, you know, this, there's this um, cutting corners, you know, maybe not doing everything the way that they thought they were going to do, disillusionment with principals and colleagues and kind of like, hey, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And just feeling the weight of the kids' needs and not figuring out how to meet those. So you can feel it yeah. every day. And I think the, the realization that we can't fix everything mm -hmm. and that even the, all the people around me can't, especially if if I'm a school that's not in a school that's not really integrated in with the community resources, mm -hmm. you know, I, it seems like the options for kids stops at our doors, and, and then, and then it is really frustrating. Right, and then it's about me. If I'm yeah. the only one, yeah, and you I'm feel like this, you're the only yeah, one. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's the burden yeah. of carrying yeah. that every day, yeah. and just feeling like, um, you know, I'm getting, I'm saying things I never thought I was going to say. I look out at my classroom and I think. Is this kid manipulating me? Mm. Or they tell me to call a parent and I think, oh, I don't want to pick up that phone. And just getting to a place that you never thought you'd be. Mm -hmm. So this next slide kind of says it all about mm. the, the next stage, withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about withdrawal, I think about exactly what this little kitten's saying, exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get so exhausted that we just detach. Mm -hmm. We can't flop down and take care of ourselves if we don't detach. Um, and yet, unfortunately, I think in that process, we're not taking care of our relationships, we're not involved in our work, or that detachment doesn't always lead to rejuvenation around exhaustion. Um, so withdrawal, I think, is it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing for me to think about well-intentioned people leaving the profession. I know you have some thoughts on why withdrawal happens. You know, I think when people get to that point where they're starting to pull back and not reach out anymore, the, there's a real crisis of confidence, a self-doubt that is so profound. Like, what am I doing enough? Am I doing the right things? Am I reaching these kids? You know, I went into this so idealistic, and now I'm feeling all these needs, and at the end of the day, the list is even longer than when I started. And, and I must that, not be doing my best. Right, right? it because must be about me if I was If I was great like I want to be, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be here. Right. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, in a typical school day, very often I would walk around and there'd be crying teachers in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And when I really explored that with them, it really was, who am I in this profession? Am I doing enough? Am I effective as I want to be? What about all these kids' needs that are unmet? What is that? So if that self-doubt wears on, um, this next stage is kind of an interesting one, a mm -hmm. scary one. And all of a sudden we're thinking, oh, how did this happen to me? How did I get so disconnected from my work? And we see educators go through periods of sleeplessness and hypervigilance and just worrying and worrying, like not just so much about the individual kids anymore, but about the work. When you say anxiety, I'm thinking about um, one way people talk about this nonspecific worry, mm -hmm. anxiety, is, is there's just that pervasive sense that something's not right, things mm -hmm. aren't right. And that, that kind of makes sense to me of when you're overwhelmed with that feeling, you can't sleep and mm -hmm. you are hypervigilant. But you don't always know why. Mm -hmm. You've lost connection with even the focus of, of all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're back to the elephant in the room. Yeah. If we can name it, if we can be aware of it, yeah. if there's vulnerability in saying, I'm tired, I care so much about these kids, these families, I don't want to be angry. That's right. This isn't who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're at a crossroads then. Mm -hmm. So at that crossroads, it's really a question of, are we as individuals, as systems, going to get sicker? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to address that elephant in the room and move towards renewal? It takes guts. Mm -hmm. It takes guts as systems to step back and say, 
the well-being of our staff, of ourselves, is critical. Mm -hmm. We're going to do what it takes. It takes guts as a person to say, mm, mm -hmm. I, I need help. Um, so I'm going to move forward and spend our time thinking about what might renewal look like and what did it look like for us. So, Sue, the goal of renewal is to really uh, reconnect with your sense of compassion, reconnect with your sense of purpose, the reason why you got into this very important profession in the first place without getting burned, without having to give up too much of yourself, and really recognizing that I do have influence every day, and paying attention to what that looks like so that you can move back into a place of hope and connection with why you're doing this and very important job. And not just cycling back to the beginning, but but having a different kind of enthusiasm and passion. So in essence, that goal then is um, to move from the zealot to this notion of compassion satisfaction. We're gonna have new kittens every year mm -hmm. as educators, right? And so what's the approach that we can take that allows us to build emotional bonds? Because we know connection is so critical with the students that we teach, with the parents, with our colleagues, but how do we do it in a way that um, just makes more sense for everyone. And I believe one of those key pieces is that we get out of the fixing mode and more into the resilience mm -hmm. mode. In addition to that, I think about this non-anxious presence. Um, we talked a lot about the worries and the anxiety. And one of the influences that we have is to show up totally present to what we're doing. Just do what we're doing while we're doing it. And give it 100% of our attention, not looking back and worrying so much about yesterday. Oh, this again. Yes, yeah. or looking forward yeah. and saying the next thing that's going to happen is mm -hmm. going to be really hard, but just staying present. Mm -hmm. Because starting with that will allow us to take better care of ourselves. Our self-care can improve. We move to intention rather than reacting because mm -hmm. we've named this thing that is getting in our way. And we know that the solution in part is just to show up totally present without carrying worries every day. And when I'm present, I'm listening, mm -hmm. I'm aware, and I'm it, kind of going back to that resilience, I'm probably going to hear some strengths out of you. Mm -hmm. If it's all about me, what I thought of yesterday, where I think we need to go, I might miss that you have solutions. Mm -hmm. and, and how do I just help nurture you to be able to put those solutions into action? Yeah. Whether it's for a math problem, or a problem on the playground, or a colleague coming to me with things. Um, yeah, that presence, I think, is a lot about realizing the strength of others. And it's what the kids yeah. tell us. Yeah. They say, you know what, it wasn't because somebody fixed it. Yeah. It's because somebody truly got me. Yeah. They listened, they were present for me. That's it. Believed in me. Mm -hmm. So there are four keys to being compassion resilient. I've already introduced this word resilience. Obviously, I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the first key is one that I spend a lot of my life doing right now, and that is um, helping people immerse themselves in stories of recovery. I am so aware that as a classroom teacher, I mentioned Chad. I, didn't, I never knew what happened to Chad. Mm -hmm. I may never know what happens to 90, 95% of the kids that I work with. Um, but what I can do is be sure that I listen to stories of resilience of youth in general, of families. You know, when I worry or think these, this family needs to be fixed, helping, I need to help myself understand resilience by purposely listening to great stories of families who have been able to find the resources that they need, who've been able to have children go to college and be the first person in their family to go to college, or the number of times that I hear from young adults that I interview about the challenges that they faced in education who say to me, it was that one teacher that believed in me, that welcomed me into the classroom, that made all the difference in my ability to move forward. That teacher never knew it. Mm. And so you may not hear from the kids that you interacted with directly, but we can purposely try to keep ourselves immersed in stories of resilience mm -hmm. in youth and families in general. The other group that has a story of resilience are our educators themselves. Mm -hmm. They have stories to tell that where they, you know, were getting a little lost in the profession, found their way back through yeah. support from other teachers or from reconnecting with their work, learning something new and growing every day. So our teachers have the same resilience stories that they can tell. So when you notice um, compassion fatigue, you're in that zombie stage, mm -hmm. hopefully you catch it sooner than that, one of the options is to reach out to a colleague. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really the second key. 
that we're going to talk about in terms of being compassion resilient is how do we connect with our colleagues. So this key of reaching out to colleagues is a very important one. Um, it's about being able to be transparent and being honest, finding someone, uh, one other teacher, part of your team, maybe your administrator who can say this is what's real for me, these are my successes, these are what's hard. But I think people who connect with their colleagues who find a way to be authentic in their teaching and be able to share that with other people kind of reduce that isolation and that frustration that people feel when they're really exhausted. So the third key that we really want to think about is um, trusting the strengths and the resiliency of our young people and also really getting where the limitations of our role are. Mm -hmm. So that you know, we, if we know that self-doubt and not feeling like we're never doing good enough is getting in the way, we can say to ourselves, being the best teacher, the best social worker, the best youth worker is enough. It is sufficient to know that in my role, if I do my best every day, that that will be uh, it's not something I have to carry. I don't have to work harder. I don't have to keep going more. I remember the moment in my own career when I realized that our families and kids have their own stories and that if I listen well and really trust that they have the strength and resiliency to move on, that it wasn't about me fixing it or making it better, that my role was I felt more calm, I felt more centered in my work when I trusted them. Mm -hmm. I think about the interviews I've done with young adults and youth around mental health challenges and two things that they've said over and over again that they needed from adults. Believe my pain is real, mm -hmm. it's hard. Sometimes we want to deny it because it's hard to hear. But secondly, believe in me. Mm -hmm. You know, It was the adults that said, you have what it takes. I believe you can face this challenge. I've, I've known other kids who face these challenges. And that, it, it, that combination, that balance is so important. I don't have to fix a mental health challenge when it arises in a youth that I'm with. I may want to, mm -hmm. but actually the best thing I can bring is a safe environment for them to learn and be engaged and to have someone believe in them in that environment and also be able to honestly say, I get that it's hard for you right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our role, I, I see it a lot, and I see it in myself. You know, you wanna do more. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been great for me recently. I've been surrounded by more colleagues from different sectors in the community, and I, I understand now that there is a community out there, and how do I connect in with them? keeps me doing the best I can at where I'm at and not feeling like I have to do it all. So the fourth key in compassion resilience is really about self-care and about balance and really making sure the mind, the body, and the spirit are working together to be at your best when you show up to school in the morning. And I know for me, um, I was working in a middle school, I was a social worker, I found a friend, a neighbor who was a teacher in a different district and we started to walk in the evenings and just deeply share about what was going on in our lives and we kind of held ourselves to tasks that we wanted to grow as people and did that mean crying and gnashing our teeth and laughing once in a while, all of that. I, I really love that example because sometimes we look at the physical, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, social, we, it's kind of like a checkoff box, mm -hmm. you know, how am I doing here, 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 but it, it, oftentimes it's in that one experience that you give yourself that it is all of those things. Mm -hmm. When it comes to emotional, this notion of a balance where fear, hate, and isolation are over here and love, laughter, and forgiveness are over here. And I, you know, I literally will ask myself when I feel a hateful thought, mm -hmm. love, laughter, forgiveness, where is, where is it right now? And, and I, I like to think of it as almost a prescription Spiritual, what, what comes to mind for you? I think there, spirituality is an individual path, and I, there's no recommendations that are one size fit all, but I think having a deep awareness about yourself and what this work is, taking time in a beautiful place, whatever that may be for you, to really reconnect mm -hmm. with who you are, your sense of self, your sense of, of service. I mean, you really do have a sense of service and being able to connect with the purpose of all that being able to restore and to go back to that place where you feel filled up. Mm -hmm. And it does take a practice, I, you know, whether it is go to a service mm -hmm. or, or it's just saying, you know, once a week I'm going to be in nature. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that connection with meaning and purpose is something we can offer to ourselves mm -hmm. on a regular basis that's really helpful. I, um, the intellectual one was interesting to me. I used to teach about stress reduction, and I loved talking about this intellectual side of us. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what it says is our minds are very flexible, mm -hmm. and when we focus on one topic um, all the time, 
our brains get a little rigid. Mm -hmm. I think this notion of keeping our brains flexible, because we know when we're in a complicated situation in the classroom, we need flexible brains that don't just go with the way we did it yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so I like thinking about intellectual as flexibility mm -hmm. uh, rather than just intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, the social one. Of all the slides I've ever shared with people in my career, there was one that talked about what healthy and unhealthy relationships looked like, and just some words defining them. And I got so many requests for that slide. Okay. And it, it, it kind of made me sad because I think what it said to me is that many of us are in unhealthy relationships and we're not sure how to get out of them, how to manage them. And so I, I think saying no to things is a lot harder than finding what we want to say yes to. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of it as, do you have three healthy relationships in your life? Mm -hmm. three, three relationships where you aren't expected to be anything other than who you are. Mm -hmm. That celebrate who you are rather than ask you to adjust something in order to be acceptable. And if I can focus on those three relationships in my life, mm -hmm. those unhealthy relationships become less of a priority and they, they don't infiltrate my soul as much if, mm -hmm. if I focus on those three healthy ones. Mm -hmm. So centering, balance, um, hopefully it doesn't feel like a prescription, hopefully it feels like an invitation. Mm -hmm. So as we're wrapping up, um, these faces showed up earlier as we were talking and we were talking about resilience and how important it is to kind of bathe ourselves in the notion of resilience. Um, these three stories are all youth who, when they talked to me, um, pointed to educators in their life. It was mm. just awesome. Charles talked about the educator that helped him to laugh and each day he would laugh with this educator and he had gone through some tough stuff and um, was getting suspended, was the problem. And just through that connection with the educator, mm -hmm. um, he was able to make a shift. Um, Simone is, is just lovely how she speaks about a high school teacher in summer school who asked her how her day was, who knew that she had a job interview and really wanted to know that, and also really cared about her grades, that somehow she put her role as educator um, in the forefront, and as a part of that, the connecting with Simone as a human being made the difference for Simone to be able to really engage in learning in a new way in her life. Um, and then Val, kind of an interesting story, goes all the way back to first grade, um, Val had been expelled from some preschools. Um, the school was, the current school was really concerned about whether she could stay there. Um, significant levels of ADHD. Mm -hmm. And she, she actually tells it in kind of funny ways. But what meant the world to her and her family was there was a teacher, first grade teacher that went to bat for her that believed in Val and believed that they could figure out ways for her to be engaged in the classroom. And that belief in the students' own abilities just changed that little girl's life. And I got to interview her as she was, um, had graduated from Lawrence University and was moving forward with her life. So those moments that the, where the educator was truly present and, and kind of believed in the student and showed up for them were the things that really made the difference. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to compassion fatigue, I think when that not good enough message comes your way, if you can remember the stories of young people that you've touched, that really promoted a change, a shift in direction for them. That is very comforting to think. You know, comforting to think my influence made such a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, compassion fatigue, as we've named it today, is real. That is not a character flaw. It certainly can take over and affect and impact our schools and the way we interact. But if we name it and we recognize the signs in ourselves, and we can avoid it and really support each other through it, if it gets to that point that we can have a more compassionate school setting, not only for the students but also for ourselves and we can reconnect with really what our profession is all about.